wise, yeah, let's give it up for Roy. Is this any better? Perfect. Okay. So, by show of hands, who here has heard of PyLint? Okay, look, most of the people here. Who here uses PyLint? More than I would expect. Cool. Um, so today we're going to be diving into PyLint, how you should use PyLint, uh, and kind of what, set, what sets PyLint apart from some of the other things in the ecosystem. Um, so we're talking about why you should be using linters as a whole. Uh, we're talking about what differentiates PyLint from some of the other linters. We're going to dive into the internals of PyLint. Uh, and kind of some of the secret sauce that makes it maybe a little bit more robust. And then we have time for questions and answers. Sound good? Cool. Uh, so before we jump in, who am I? Uh, my name is Roy Williams. Uh, I'm an engineer at Lyft. Uh, I focus on a team called Core Libraries where we effectively own the Python stack at Lyft. Um, a big part of this has been our Python 3 migration, and this is how I came to be a contributor to PyLint. Um, most of the recent contributions, the PyLint uh, fixers, have, or PyLint checkers, have come from Lyft. Um, so we generally, as we port code over, if there is anything that we think static analysis should have found before we caught later down the line, we try to implement a linter for it, or better yet, an automatic fixer for it. Uh, my email is rwilliams at lift.com if you want to get in touch. Um, but f before we get into PyLint, I want to get into why, why we should use linters in general. Um, you've heard all the, the normal stuff, to find bugs automatically, to enforce inconsistent code style across the code base, blah, 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 and like, that, I mean, and, and there's some merit to this kind of stuff. As, as an example, uh, take a look at this code here, and what do you think this code will print? You don't need to shout it out, but just kind of, kind of think. Um, you kind of have a general idea of what you think it prints out? Okay, what about now? Is it any clearer? Maybe, maybe a little bit clearer? Um, so it turns out there's actually a lot of good science behind this. University of Indiana did a study where they uh, put code in front of people that was using a variety of different code styles, and it turns out the latter example, people got wrong 20% more. Uh, and so if you go back and look at an example, it only has one space indent, it has this big gap between the count is and done counting, and so if you're glossing over some code, you can see how you can really easily misinterpret what this code does. Uh, and so without a doubt, there's a ton of value in that aspect of this. Um, but for me, code re the, the real value of linters is up-leveling your code review. Uh, who here has ever done a code review of maybe an unfamiliar piece of code, or you ask someone to review some code who isn't familiar with what you're working on, and the first thing they revert to is being a pep eight in it. Um, it just, it turns out that doesn't add a lot of value. Uh, like, linters are really good at catching this. And so if you lean on linters, they can do all of that work for you, forcing your code reviewers to focus on the value add, to make sure they understand the code, making sure they um, are actually catching bugs. Uh, and in fact, this can sometimes lead to blindness. Who, has anyone here seen uh, Remy Hedinger's talk beyond pep eight? A few people? Okay, so for those of you who haven't seen this talk, uh, but this, you should go and watch this talk. He's a way better speaker than I am. Um, but the, the crux of it is that while Pep8 is a useful tool, it should not be kind of seen as a religion that you must enforce. Uh, and one of the examples that he gives is this video right here. Oh, before I get started with this video, what I want you to do is you're gonna, there's going to be people in white shirts and black shirts. And I want you to count how many times someone in a white shirt catches the ball. Okay, got it? For the sake of speed, let's speed this up. Okay. Let's go. Okay, there's one, there's another, there's a dribble, they passed again, another pass, another pass, another pass, another over the shoulder, yep, there's a pass, uh, another one, and for those of you who are laughing, uh, so for those of you who weren't laughing, maybe you, you, you missed what was going on here. Um, the whole point of this is that a gorilla walks through the screen midway through, pounds his chest, and then walks, walks us out of the frame. Uh, and if all you are focused on is style mitts, that is you in code review. All you are focused on is how many spaces and whether or not there is a proper doctrine here, and you're not catching the real issues in your code. Um, and it turns out there's actually good, good science here as well. Uh, Microsoft did some studies where they looked at the value of code review. The first question they asked people is, what value do you see in code review? Uh, number one answer is finding defects, then code improvements, alternate solutions, knowledge transfer, all, all of this good stuff. Like, and, and probably the reasons why you do code review at your companies. Um, but when it turns out when they looked at what kind of comments were addressed in code review, uh, the vast majority were code improvements or understanding or social communication. Uh, defects was four. 
Um, and now this isn't totally unreasonable, right? Like it's way more valuable to catch a defect in code review time. So it's not totally unreasonable, but it is not the expectations for what people have for why you do code review. Uh, similarly, th then they ask people what level of understanding they feel is required to address these different issues, finding defects and alternative solutions they felt required the most understanding of, a, of an underlying system. Um, so if you take nothing else from this talk, think about linters as tools that force, your en that force engineers and your teams to be on these top two levels of understanding the code and not just being a style knit. Because I can go look at any code base and knit the shit out of it with, auto with Pep8, but auto Pep8 is really good at that, so why, why should I waste my time on it? Cool. So let's get into how Pylint plays into this. So how is Pylint different than some of the other linters here? Uh, so imagine that we have a matrix of all of the possible um, properties that a, that a linter could have. Um, so the ideal linter would, of course, find all of the issues and have zero false, false positives. Um, and of course, that'd be great, but we, we can never get there. Flakegate tends to bias more towards having zero false positives at the cost of finding less issues. Pylint tends to be in the other quadrant. It will find more issues, but you have to deal with more false positives. Um, and we can talk some about how to make this trade-off work for you. Uh, and so Pylint isn't all you know, sunshine and rainbows. The, the most common complaint about Pylint is that you have a reasonably working code base, you point Pylint at it, and it gives you a score of two out of 10 and finds 10,000 issues. And you know, your spidey senses start tingling, you start thinking, well, like, this code actually works and runs in production, there's probably not 10,000 things wrong with it. Um, and so generally people here just like, kind of bail on Pylint. Um, but hopefully we can show you how to, how to get more value out of it. Cool, so let's hop into a quick demo of Pylint. Um, so I have, of course, my contrived example here. Um, so we import some things. We have a function that always returns false. Uh, we have a function here that, that clearly has some things wrong with it. And my ID is highlighting some things, but not others. Uh, we implement what I think is a context manager. I'm not too sure, though. Um, and then I have a function that, um, uh, that, return, that, that uses the new type annotation stuff that Guido was talking about. So cool, let's, let's see what Pylint, or what, say, Flakegate says about this code. So it flags a couple issues. It flagged that the OS import isn't used, but it also flagged that the typing list import isn't used, which, which isn't true. It's used in the type annotation down here. Um, so that's a little fr frustrating. And also flagged that this value here, ex executed, isn't used. Um, cool, so it found you know, two real issues with my code, one not so real issue with my code. Um, so let's take a look at what Pylint says. So Pylint says my code is garbage. It said a whole bunch of stuff here. I don't have any doc strings here because I'm a bad person. I'm redefining variables. It's just a mess. Um, so, one second. So one of the first tips I have for using Pylint is start with the most valuable uh, error messages. So right now, we're gonna suppress um, any refactoring, any comments, or any warnings. Oh, cool, so we have one error with our code that Pylint has flagged. So it's flagged that I've implemented the exit method of this context manager incorrectly, which is correct. I need the, uh, I can't remember the off the top of my head, the other two parameters to properly implement the exit function here. Now, this is something that Flakegate will not flag. Flakegate thinks, well, maybe you do mean to have a dunder exit method. Uh, I don't know, it could be. Um, and so because it's legit Python says, sure. Um, Pylint will, will actively warn about this. Uh, so let's, let's imagine we fix that and go look at some of the warnings as well. Um, so Pylint is, is catching that we are re redefining some variables, variables foo, um, which we have the variable here foo, and we are defining the method foo. So this foo is shadowing this foo. Um, we have uh, a conditional statement with a constant value, which is super useful. Um, so here I have always false, but I, I'm just referring to the function definition, which will always be truthy, right? It is always not null. So this will always evaluate, which uh, will always evaluate the true, which is almost always a bug. Um, and again, something Pylint is willing to flag, but it's valid Python code, so Flake8 won't flag it. Um, we have a warning about unreachable code. Uh, this code here is clearly unreachable because we raise, a, we raise an exception. Um, the, the error message about uh, the exit. But one thing you'll, you'll notice here is that it does not warn me about the list import. Pylint knows that the, that the, um, the, the, list, the list method is in fact used here. <coughs> um, 
And now switching gears a little bit, one of the, the other most useful features about PyLint has been the Python 3 support, um, which is where I spend most of my, which is where I make most of my contributions. So one second. Okay, does anyone know what's wrong with this code for Python 3? Ah, that's fine. Um, that's why we have linters, right? We don't, I don't want you to be automatic human linters. Um, so PyLint has flagged that the string module uh, no longer has the method lower on it. Um, interestingly, I do something bad like this and replace the symbol string with just an empty string, I no longer get any warnings. So, so PyLint has symbolically understood my code here, which is pretty interesting. So let's get into how this works. Um, so just, uh, I'm not gonna talk too much about how PyLint itself works. It is a, what you'd expect from most linters. You parse some stuff out of an AST, you implement a visitor pattern. It's great, go look at the code. Uh, where most of the magic happens though is in a module called Asteroid. Asteroid is a wrapper around the AST module, works for both Python 2 and Python 3. It <coughs> um, has some really interesting properties about it. So just kind of out of the gate, we have some function print foo. We can get the node, we can get the AST for the node, kind of what you'd expect if you've ever worked on a static analysis tool. But where Asteroid starts getting really interested is when it comes to inference. Um, oh, and so just to quickly talk about this code here, uh, we, there's a method extract node that has the magic comment uh, hash at that will specify that's the node it is extracting, and so just a, a useful uh, helper method. Um, so say we have this code here, x equals three, y equals five. Uh, so we, the, the node x plus z is a binary operation uh, with the left of x, right of z, uh, and it can't infer anything about this because it has no idea what z is. Um, but let's change this to x to y. So interestingly, it knows the statement x plus y is a constant. And it knows the value of that statement is eight. Um, the pretty, pretty interesting. It's actually like done some amount of symbolic ex execution to figure this out. Uh, similarly, here's the uh, example for what we were looking at before um, with the string module. So we import string, we call string.lower, uh, and we get the, um, the we infer what the type of the expression is. Uh, and, and we get a module, it, it is in fact the string module, the built-in string module, yeah. Sure. So we get the built-in string module here. Um, cool. But if I then shadow string, the receiver, the left-hand side is now a constant string. Um, and let's see what the limits of this symbolic ex execution is. So now we have a, a class A um, that implements the add method by adding the other's bar field plus my foo divided by two. Um, and th th this code returns 45 if you execute, if you add together A and B. Um, interestingly, if we ask Asteroid what the type of A plus B is, it knows it is the constant 45. So the symbolic execution here is actually fairly rich and fairly deep. Um, and kind of one last quick thing to go over here uh, for the type annotations uh, Asteroid useful, uh, very usefully has a annotation field that you can get to. <coughs> um, so I've declared A uh, as a list of sets of integers, uh, very, very complicated stuff here. Um, and I can get out the annotation from that as well, which we can then use in PyLint to implement future checkers. Uh, pretty, pretty cool stuff. Cool. So back to the slides. Um, so how to effectively use PyLint, uh, start with warnings, then start with errors, then turn on warnings. Uh, if you start with the everything on, you're just, you're gonna have a bad time. Um, what we, this isn't anything we're doing yet, but something that we want to start doing in the future is split apart the mandatory rules from the suggestions. Um, <coughs> and we want to surface the, the suggestions at code review time, uh, have them comment on existing code, but don't actually enforce them. And so, you know, PyLint will notice like, hey, your method's getting kind of big. Uh, you may want to think about refactoring it, which is a comment that a code reviewer may make, um, but it's nothing that you necessarily want to enforce, right? You want to enable people to ignore these things if they really choose to do so. Uh, as an example, Lyft, as a plug for something we open source at Lyft, uh, we have a tool called Linty Fresh, whose only job in life is to turn lint errors into GitHub comments. Um, and this is super effective 
with that idea of what we talked about of having the robots handle all of kind of the nits uh, and having humans handle all the important stuff. Uh, cool. So with that, I think we were right on 15 minutes. Do we have any time for questions? Yeah. 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 So, good question. So, the question was uh, if during symbolic execution, uh, for whatever reason, it bails, uh, how does that report that? So, this code up here <coughs> uh, is the example. Uh, you call infer, which returns a generator of the possible types that it, that it could be. Uh, if it, nothing can be inferred, it throws a name inference error. Um, so in, in this case here, we, that's when we just print out could not infer. So if I change this to Z, it prints out could not infer instead of you know, a node with the value of eight. Cool. Any Crystal other questions? Thing? Yeah. Yeah, we got one. Yeah, so the question was, is there an auto-fix setting for PyLint? Uh, unfortunately not. This is something that some of the newer static analysis tools are starting to put in, like Error Prone from Google, which is a Java static analysis tool, uh, has the option to implement a fixer for every issue. Uh, generally, again, we, we mostly do this in the context of Python 3 porting. We try to use uh, Python Modernize to catch most of the things, so then we have both the verification and the fixer built in. But frankly, two to three doesn't have as nice of an API as Pilot does, doesn't do the same amount of inference, so it can't catch all of the issues. Yeah, good question. Great. Asher? Hey, um, do any of these tools give some measure of type safety at function interfaces? So, like, there are various schemes of putting decorators on functions to try to get some type safety. Could these tools um, eliminate the need for such checking? Uh, so, the, in, in terms of like surfacing the type safety, uh, yes, one of the things that I actually Lyft contributed to MyPy is that you can have MyPy dump out Cobra XML, which like any other code coverage tool can read in. And so you can use this to get a sense for how covered your code is with, with types. Um, in terms of does this replace the type annotations, uh, there, there are like big limits to the inference engine. Like the, of course, because this is a talk, the demo that I gave here is like, pretty much as far as the inference engine goes. Um, so it, it, like, I, I am starting to explore how we can start to marry the two. Like, can we get from Asteroid some of the types that can currently be inferred to kind of bootstrap type information? Um, but this is still something that's very exploratory. Great. Cool. Yeah, great Alrighty. job, Roy. Come find me afterwards if you have any other questions. Definitely. Yeah, pilot. I mean, I w what I want to see is what that pilot RC looks like in your real projects. Uh, I don't know. I just added one to mine, and it's pretty long. Yeah, that, that's one of the things that the pilot team wants to work on. Is there's been talk of like having different levels for your code, and you can like start off with like level zero, and then you fix all the errors and go to level one. So it's gonna be something we will likely bake into pilot itself, mm -hmm. so that you don't have these like here are the best practices for like pilot RC files. Like for example. I think cyclomatic complexity is usually a bullshit metric because all that happens is whoever trips over it is like, well, shit, now we've got to extract something into a method. Right. You've added zero value. You've made the code more complicated. Okay. Um, but I mean, that's anyway. a strong opinion. About. I'm sure you can find some d dissenters out there. But no, <laughs> very, very